A few years ago, my son Cal was a happy four-year-old little boy who loved school so much that when he got a pet fish, he decided to name it after his teacher, Mr. Barr. Then one day, Mr. Barr left, and the teacher that replaced him didn't have the same tools or training to relate to Cal. Happy grams turned into nasty grams, which ultimately turned into this voicemail. Hi, Don. Um, I've been with Cal most of the day today, and he is totally out of control, disrespectful, disobedient. I need you to come and get him, and he is not going to return. I hope you understand. Thank you. Bye. In that moment, I felt as if I had just failed at the one thing I care most about, being a great dad. It reminded me of the time that I was in school, and like Cal, on my way out. Years ago, I stumbled into Normandale Community College when I couldn't get a job at a fast food restaurant. When you show up to school the day before classes start, you get all the courses that no one else wants. For me, that was chemistry. In my second semester, I had chemistry with Dr. Reznicek, and I finally landed that job, except this restaurant had real napkins and real silverware. So the obvious thing to do was to drop out. Then one day, Dr. Reznicek asked to see me after class. I spent the entire period trying to figure out what I had done wrong. When I approached him, he handed me a piece of paper. I looked at it. It was my exam. I'd gotten 75 out of 100. So I asked, what's the problem? And he looked at me through glasses that only chemistry teachers wear and said, I'd like to see you get 100. That's all he said, but that's not all I heard. I heard, Delon, you can do this. You have the ability, and I care. So for the rest of the semester, I tried to get 100. And although I never actually got a perfect score, I stayed in school, nearly doubled my GPA, and eventually graduated from Harvard. So even though I had no idea what was going on with Cal or how to be helpful, I had to get 100, because this time it wasn't just personal, it was paternal. In education, there's a saying that a parent is a child's first teacher. So I tried to become the best teacher that I could be. I immersed myself in the research on what kids need to succeed and how to develop it. I met with experts, I read papers, I took classes. I spent a lot of time in classrooms and I learned a lot from teachers. The deeper I went, the more I realized that our education system is broken and I wasn't sure if it was fixable. In fact, I felt that if we took all of the science on child development and then just did the opposite, it would more closely resemble US education. What if changing education was as simple as learning how to play? I'm gonna share with you how voice technology and more specifically a voice interactive toy has the potential to change the conversation on how kids learn. There are three big problems in education. The first is that we're not focused on the most important period of development. The first eight years of life are critical. It's when we start to build our social, emotional, language, and cognitive skills. However, for every dollar that we spend on K through 12 education, we only spend about a nickel on early education. To put that into context, 90% of the brain is formed before kindergarten, but more than 90% of funding comes after it. Not surprisingly, we have one of the lowest rates of early childhood education. The second big problem is that we're not focused on the most important skills. Although science and technology and math are incredibly important, the skills that often lead to success in school and beyond are things like empathy, self-control, creativity, grit, a growth mindset. Basically, all of the skills that you hear about in TED Talks, but that we rarely focus on in schools. And the last problem has to do with how we engage kids. Cal's not the first kid to be called disobedient, and. I'm not gonna be the last student to think that they're in trouble when a teacher wants to meet. That's my point. We often focus on teaching kids to be obedient and to follow directions than on actually inspiring them to learn. I believe technology has to play a role. But if we're being honest, most technology wasn't designed for early learners. 
Touch interfaces aren't natural. Rigid form factors aren't playful. And visual content often overstimulates kids rather than engaging them. In fact, I'd contend most technology is not only not helping, it's actually exacerbating the problems. Let me explain why. When kids lack access to school, they gain access to something else, screens. Although the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends kids under six to spend no more than one hour per day in front of a screen, the average young child spends almost three hours per day in front of them. And when schools close due, due to COVID, screen time more than doubled. So why is excessive screen time such a big problem? Well, do you remember that PSA from the 1980s that showed what our brains look like on drugs? Well, this is a kid. This is a kid on a screen. And this is what kids' brains look like on screens. In the blue are the neural pathways associated with language and literacy. Think of them as our information highways that we want to be focused and organized. On the left, you see the brain of a preschooler who is often read to. And on the right is the brain of a preschooler who spends a couple hours per day in front of a screen. As you can see, the brain on the left is far more organized and focused than the brain on the right. That's much more sporadic. The truth is, we don't have a practical, scalable way to reach kids where they're at, which is often at home, without a screen. The other issue is that kids don't build social skills by pushing buttons or self-control by staring at screens. These are all developed through back and forth interaction and by modeling behavior. So they're hard to build and they're hard to scale. The bottom line is that most technology is not only impractical during the most important period of development, but it's also impractical for developing the most important skills. And screens aren't just affecting kids. The average adult spends almost 10 hours per day in front of a screen. Whether we like it or not, adults are always teaching because kids are always learning. If we're serious about changing education, we're gonna have to change our behavior. But how do we do it? How do we engage young kids that are hard to reach, help them build skills that are difficult to teach, and how do we help adults to practice what we preach? What if we replaced screen time with speech? Kids don't learn to read until around age six, but they can speak in sentences by age three. A few years ago, voice technology, like Alexa, was just starting to take off. And Cal <laughs> literally dreamed about playing with toys. So I thought if I could combine voice technology in the form factor of a plush toy, every child could learn in a safe, natural, and scalable way. This is what it looked like. And this is Cal working on his letter blends. Do stone and story. Start with the letters S-T or S-H. S-T. <laughs> Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Ten in a row. Way to go. Cal loved it, and I love that you could see his wheels really turning. We even started winning awards. In fact, the letter game that you just saw won the grand prize in the Alexa EdTech Challenge. So effectively, I developed a smart toy that could engage young kids that are hard to reach. So then I wanted to know, could we help kids build skills that are difficult to teach? You saw Cal working on his early literacy skills. And so I wanted to know, could we help kids build social and emotional skills, like empathy? The best example that I've ever seen to help kids build empathy is Jane Elliott's Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes experiment. In 1968, she separated her third grade class by eye color. And she told the kids with blue eyes that they were smarter and would get special privileges. Pretty soon, the kids with blue eyes teased the other kids, and then they all stopped playing together. And then she reversed roles and gave the other kids privileges. And by the end, every child knew exactly what it was like to be teased for being different. I have a secret. Robots don't have feelings or empathy. So I thought if I could create an interactive experience where kids could teach the robot what it's like to be a kid or how it feels to be different, we might help them build perspective, which is the root of empathy. 
Now let me share with you some perspective on what it's like to be a seven-year-old with two younger brothers. I love being two years old because every day I learn something new. I also get free admission to the train museum. I'm curious, how old are you? Seven. Wow, you are so old. What's it like to be seven? It's like you have to be the leader of everything. By empowering kids to play the role of teacher, I realized we could help kids build social skills, executive function skills, almost anything. In fact, I even created a cleanup game where kids could teach the robot <laughs> what it's like to clean up, which comes in really handy when you've got three young kids at home. More importantly, it no longer relied just on artificial intelligence, but it relied on something greater human intelligence and emotional intelligence. More importantly, we have a way to engage young kids that are hard to reach, help them build skills that are difficult to teach. And so then I wondered, can we help adults to practice what we preach? Because kids have zero chance at reaching their full potential without supportive adults. Although we all want kids to be successful, the real question is, how do we become the best teachers that our kids need us to be by talking. One of the most commonly cited studies in the history of education research is Hart and Risley's study on early language environments. It's what led to the so-called word gap. It turns out that it's less about how many words kids are exposed to and much more about engaging them in rich back and forth conversation and responsive language, like you could see in the videos. This isn't hard but it does take practice. Let's think, why is it so important that we talk with kids and not at them? I want you to imagine that you're a four-year-old and you're constantly being told to stop, be quiet, sit down. Would that change how you feel about learning? Kids will often forget what we say, at least my kids do, but they will never forget how we make them feel. It took me almost 20 years to realize why Dr. Resnicek could change my trajectory in one conversation. And it has to do with something called self-determination theory. And it's the most important thing that I've learned about human development. Basically, kids learn best when they feel three things. When they feel competent, like they're successful. When they have agency or control over their development. And most importantly, when they feel loved. It's really easy to label kids as problems these days. Cal was never the problem. In fact, Cal, or C-A-L, was actually the solution. Because helping kids feel competent, giving them agency and showing them love is exactly how we inspire them to love learning. And you may even get a fish named after you too. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you don't need a voice interactive toy to do this, but it can help, and here's why. When kids play the role of teacher, they feel competent. When kids are guiding play, whether by themselves or with others, they have agency. And when adults learn to model conversational turn-taking and responsive language, they feel loved. So what started out as a kid's toy has now also become an adult toy, but we'll call it an educational tool, so nobody gets in trouble. More importantly, you can see how a voice interactive toy or tool can engage young kids that are hard to reach, help them build skills that are difficult to teach, and even help us big kids to practice what we preach while getting kids excited about learning again. Our education system has been failing many kids for far too long. Technology is not going away, but it can be invisible. Voice technology has the potential to change education by helping kids play to learn while adults learn to play. Although play is one of the first things that we all learn how to do, we often forget how to play as we get older. If we want to change education, we all need to relearn how to play. Let me close with a story about a superhero. Her name is Mrs. Nagel, and she was Cal's next teacher. When she realized that Cal loved coins and was good at math, she created a coin counting game just for him, and he looked forward to it every single day. 
Although it wasn't easy, she hand sewed Cal's little heart right back together by helping him feel confident, giving him agency, and she loved him, and we loved her. Pretty soon, Cal was back to feeling like Cal again. No technology can ever replace the role of a supportive adult, but even superheroes need help. And that's the role that a voice interactive toy can play. Thank you.